Welcome to a webinar on helping artists reshape creative vision featuring Sevilla Smith, hosted by ASMP director Tom Kennedy. Take it away, Tom. All right. Thank you, Doug Pizak. Thank you, Stretch Ledford. And thank you, Nicholas Freeman, for providing the technical assistance to today's webinars. And welcome, everybody. We're delighted to have as our guest Sibylla Smith. Sibylla and I have been engaged in a running conversation for the last few months. And I found her con our conversations together incredibly interesting. And I think you're in for a real treat. Sibylla is an independent curator and educator and also a creative consultant. And she works very closely with artists of all types, but particularly photographers, helping them to develop and gain new insights into their own artistic processes. She has something that she's pioneered as an exercise called Concept Aware, and uh, I'm sure she'll be addressing that as part of the presentation today. So again, welcome everybody, and I'll turn it over now to Sibylla. Thank you, Tom. I'm really happy to be here with you. Um, inspired ideas into impactful images. That's actually my medium. I am not a photographer. Uh, I love to take photographs, but I developed a curriculum called Concept Aware that at its heart takes your inspired ideas and we collaborate together to make impactful images. And I'm going to walk you through a few aspects of the um, program, Concept Aware. It is given in so many different formats. And I thought since it is new to the ASMP audience, I would give you a taste of it. Uh, we're going to do an exercise. I am going to ask a few questions. And when I go into uh, other formats where I teach, we get to expand it. It's a very nimble curriculum. I can give you a broad brush today. And then if we did a weekend or a five day, it unpacks. Because what I'm talking about is a creative practice. And as anything else that you practice, the more you do it, the better you get, the easier it gets. So here is Concept Aware. And I created this to take creative, visual creatives and people making visual narratives, visual storytellers through a process. And it's really to make you aware of your concept on as many levels as possible because simply by bringing your awareness to your work, you will change your work. So these are the steps I wanna take you through. Looking at seeing, because seeing is key and there's a lot of things in the way of seeing clearly. Um, I want you to identify the dynamics of concept development. And it's really challenging because concept development is not static. It is something that is always moving. The edges are porous. So if you can imagine trying to take something that is so dynamic and hold it to understand it, that's why there's not a lot of people doing what I do, because it is a challenge to hold the process, illuminate it, and play with it. But once you do, it's really, really fun, and you see the impact in your work, and it's synergistic. Um, I want to build your visual language. We're all becoming more visually sophisticated. We see so much more imagery than we did 20 years ago. However, as visual narrators, we are asked to talk and sometimes write about our work. And I want you to have an expansive vocabulary. And when you do work around concept aware and your creative practice, one goal should be to increase your visual language. And lastly, to articulate specifics of creative practice. And that's a challenge um, because it is not rudimentary. It is not A always is gonna come uh, before B. It's, it's a, uh, a living, breathing, moving uh, entity. However, there are so many intersections where you make choices and I want to illuminate them because you have more than one choice and I want to encourage you to experiment at those intersections. This is what I hope that my short presentation will do. I want to leave you with these two major questions. 
basically you thinking about this and unpacking this for yourself. How do you see and why it matters? That could take you a long time to be working on and perfecting and seeing just what is unique to your perception. So when we have more time, uh, we go through the things that are listed here below. We talk about creativity. We talk about photography. We do something called punctum practice. We look at what supports inspired ideas. And I have a whole curriculum and impending pub publication on elements of creative practice because I came up with a framework to help people see where they are in their creative practice and to expand it. Um, in answer to why it matters, when you work on developing how you see, it will show up in your, your work and that's why it matters. And the more awareness you bring to your creative practice, the more impactful your images can be. This is actually my premise in Concept Aware. I was challenged to come up with a way to um, put what I do in a sentence. And this is my sentence. An impactful image is the result of taking an inspired idea through a process of experimentation and refinement, aware, that is the key word, of choices decision-making, and use of elements in the creative practice. So what I'm encouraging people to do is be in their practice in a conscious way, in an aware way that isn't often focused on specifically, and being able to articulate where you make choices and what options for decision-making do you have. And what elements are you using? Because I know that you're all using a variety of elements. I want you to be aware of what they are. I also want to offer you ways to play and delve in some other ways of seeing that might be completely new to you. And they do not take over your predominant way of seeing, but they will inform it. And that's really important to keep your work alive and dynamic. I love this. Uh, basically, if I had to put what I do in a photograph, um, I'm trying to unravel uh, and increase awareness and really focus on what you see. Uh, this is Mark Somer, and I just think this is so fitting for uh, a metaphor, a visual of what I do. This is a quote because this is also what I do. Part of my job is to make you comfortable being uncomfortable. It's really a key. Uh, it's a good thing. Uh, this quote is by Kira Lesky in her book, The Storm of Creativity. She is a um, author and she is also a, um, excuse me, I'm in a space where the UPS has come. Um, and uh, excuse me one second for interrupting, but I am at Digital Silver Imaging and I uh, did that because it was better internet. And um, uh, sorry about the interruption, um, but uh, at any rate, I digress. Um, aware, this quote by Kira Lesky from her book, The Storm of Creativity, talks about awareness of uncertainty as your friend will help you navigate genuine creativity. So when you feel uncomfortable, which is bound to happen in your creative practice, that's a good sign. And my role and my job is to help you become comfortable with being uncomfortable. So if I leave you after our little presentation with more questions than answers, I'm okay with that. Uh, that's kind of how I perceive my job, and um, I think it really informs your work. So here, Tom, I'll take some tips from you. I'm going to ask a question of what people think photography is, because there is a huge medium that we wrap our hands around. And let's just see if a few of our participants can put up, what do you think photography is? All right. So please... Uh 
put your answers in the chat box. What do you think, as echoing Sevilla, what do you, how do you, would you define photography? What do you think it is? Now, come on, don't be shy. This is intended to be a participatory process today, part of what we're doing. All right, so the first one from John is memory representation. Mm -hmm. Aaron says writing with light. Bob says capture, ooh, you guys are going too fast. Capturing with intent, image capture on film or pixels, capturing present time awareness. Like all other arts, I think photography is an expression of one's thoughts, ideas, perceptions. Photography is the art of seeing, the recording of light, capturing moments. One tool in my kit to create art, the truest expression of living in the now, sharing the world, light gesture, documentation that results in a call to action, creating emotion, visual storytelling, visual representation through a mechanical or technical vehicle, keeping people I love with me, a means of expression and what cannot be seen, mm. visual representation of what cannot be said in words, mm -hmm. visual enlightenment, mm. use like a brush, walking the wire, and this is a quote from Carl Walenda in response, walking the wire is living, the rest is just waiting. That's what photography is for a photographer. Then story capture, a language, interpreting a scene, capturing a meaningful moment in time and space, and finally an expression of an impression. Fantastic. Oh, there's more. Transformation <laughs> of a subject. Wow. Well, I'm really, really impressed. And I love asking that question because um, it's just a very exciting time to be a photographer and photography is rapidly changing. So our definition of what is photography is just hugely expansive. I wanted to just give two um, echoes. I was listening to Jocelyn Lee uh, in a um, gallery talk recently um, on Zoom and she talked of photography as being a philosophical tool which I really liked that quote. And someone echoed what I also um, agree, a language and that a language that is beyond words. Um, here is something that I think of. The lens is a catalyst for metamorphosis. And that's because our ability to articulate how we see so matters because we can change how other people see. We can change how they see. We can change how they feel. We can change what they believe. We can make things possible that we didn't think were possible. And that's why I think it's such an incredibly exciting time to be a photographer. And it's why I look at creativity and photography as something during this uh, health crisis and pandemic as this little sliver of an opportunity. Um, and that's because we are in uncertain times, but this offers opportunities that we wouldn't have before. And it offers opportunity for where we go from here. It's a massive, pause button and in crisis the root meaning is both hope and opportunity or sorry danger and opportunity and i i i go with uh rebecca soltnick's different definition of hope which is not being wildly optimistic that everything is going to turn out all right or being pessimistic to say this is the end but to find hope which holds the space for what can happen informed by what we're going through now. So I feel photography is particularly important right now. Another question, what is creativity? All right, you've heard the question. What's your answer? Come on, don't be shy. Let's have some thoughts. What's creativity? Creation. Where, when my brain explodes with ideas, <laughs> seeing what everyone else sees, but in a different way, 
expression, a way of being, white heat, inception, something I lack about 50% of the time, that's honest. I'll echo that. Openness to experimentation, thinking outside the box, seeing or presenting the world in a unique way, making internal, external, through visual, auditory, et cetera, methods. Your inner voice, experimentation with and without intention, insight and action, using my individual interpretation projected onto the physical, a way of dancing with the universe. Creating a way is a, creativity is a way of thinking and expression that is considered unique and or exciting. An itch that has to be scratched, aliveness, spiritual power, distilling, distillation and representing of this essence, moments of clarity, taking ideas and making them your own, communicating in a way that is uniquely yours, the need to make, invent, and express feelings, manifesting my thoughts and dreams into the physical world, searching for the source of your existence. Creativity is living in expressiveness. It's changing the known and obvious to something different. Difference, turning off the internal sensor, and that's with a C, allowing yourself to fail my personal vision from nothing into something. Wow, that's great. And here's one more, giving birth to something from the heart. Ah, I like that too. From the heart is true. I loved the uh, white heat, the dance with the universe. Um, I collect definitions of creativity and um, I have thousands just from workshops, but um, one time in preparing, I counted in a thesaurus and there's over 240 synonyms for creativity. So it's a massive uh, entity we can all play in for a long time. This is my definition of creativity, a framework for imagination. And frankly, imagination has no bounds, which is why when we are in the situation we're in, we are not limited uh, in terms of our imagination. It actually really stretches us. Um, and uh, that's where I see the opportunity here in the, in the present situation that, that we're in. Um, and in the class, I go into more definitions, but this is, a, this is a graphic I use to say one of the ways that I look at creativity is this is four pillars of creativity, that these are four entities that are going to be part of your creative practice, frankly, whether you want it or not, or whether you admit it or not, or whether you're thinking about it or not, they're there. So the four things are inspiration, collaboration, appropriation and critique. And these again are synergistic and uh, dynamic. And when we work in concept aware, we pull those apart and we find ways in which to um, almost have buckets for these different things. Um, so that whoever mentioned that 50% of the time it's not active, well, we can get you uh, to a, a different um, relationship with that. This is something that I happen to just love, and Joel Meyerowitz, the photographer, said this, the things that you notice reflect the way the world speaks to you. No two people in the same place at the same time ever see the same thing. And I just love that quote as a premise for how important your ability to understand how you see needs to be articulated because it is unique and it has qualities and you need to be a curious about those qualities and you need to be involved in a conversation with your work. It is synergistic. Your work is talking to you if you listen and that's part of what I try to really um, instigate and uh, promote and assist with. So let's go to something that um, 
we're going to do here and it's called punctum practice and i'm not sure who on our call has ever heard of punctum or knows what it is but if you hang out with me you do um, one of the things that i have is a blog called punctum junkie i have a hashtag that i put out there for punctum junkie because basically i am addicted to punctum and here is a quote from the man who started it all, Roland Barthes, who is a French philosopher, and in Camera Lucida, he was talking about the emotional impact of a photograph. Um, for those of you who have read the book, which is 40 years old just this year and a seminal uh, part of art historical readings, um, the book is about his search for a photograph the winter garden or not search but his ruminating on this photograph that actually contains the essence of his mother who had recently deceased and in so doing as a french philosopher does he digs and he goes through this and he comes up with two aspects to a photograph punctum being the emotional impact of a photograph. And this is what he says about punctum. You receive punctum, the thinking eye, as the power of expansion. And his description of punctum, why he uses the Latin word for puncture, is it what comes out of the image and literally punctures your heart. It pierces you. We had a description there uh, in the creativity that, that I think spoke to that. So the thinking eye that is punctum. The other aspect of photography that he talked about was stadium, which is more the formal aspects where we could all look at a photograph of a uh, landscape and describe aspects of it that are more about composition and form. Um, punctum is much harder to describe and it is much more varied depending on the viewer. So we're gonna go into something called punctum practice. And this is what I do with people. And if you have a five day with me, we do it every day because this is something that becomes a visual tool for you. And I'll tell you at the end how you can use it for your own work. So here's the rules. We are gonna go through, I think I have five images. And what I'm going to do is ask you within a timed period to come up with five responses. And I want you to write those in the chat and we will go through 30 seconds each image and then we'll go back and Tom, you can tell me some of the quote unquote responses to each of these. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay, Tom. Just scanning back to where we got started here. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. The first one says lacking stopping power, torso, but why? Tropical heat, confusion or disorientation, summer tropical fashion, sun bleached suburban, brightness, color, energy, cut, sunlight, marketing jumble, history, visually confusing, confusing, too busy, confused reflection, out of time, limbo, lurking, color, distancing, hidden assets. And I think that's where we stop for that first one. Great. That's so interesting because actually, um, in retrospect, several of you are giving me your opinion. You're not giving me a feeling. You're giving me um, intellect. You're saying it's confusing. You're met with it and you don't like it. You don't like that it is not giving you uh, information the way you like to get information. So now that I get that information from your response that more than one said, uh, limbo to busy, confusion, um, in my class, I would then ask each of you that had that kind of a reaction to try to make an image that was confusing or that appropriated this image in a way that pushed you to do something like it because that's how you use this. Your attractions are, are equal to what you find aversive. So both are really important pieces of information. I, when I was in design school, I had to, um, I was uh, learning clothing design and I had to do a entire line based on things I didn't like. And I went and worked with colors that I personally don't like. And honestly, by the time I finished having a creative process with these things that I would never normally go for naturally, I had a different experience with them. So that's part of something I want to teach you in Concept Aware, to keep track of your aversions and to uh, play with them. This one. All right, this one. Elegant, mysterious, purity and passion, beauty, elegance, stunning, powerful sense of self in the woman, fierce grip, purity, beauty, calm, serene, anticipating, wedding, proud, unusually, purely sensation. Contrast. Okay, again, uh, that's great. I do hear um, intellect a little bit. Um, we got at it with purity or um, anticipating. Anticipating, that's, that's where uh, we're starting to scratch at punctum. When you're in that feeling realm of um, what is your, in, in psychology, which is what I actually uh, have a master's in social work, what I studied, it would be called, it would, what I'm after when we do punctum practice is what is called primary process thinking. It's when you don't get your mind in it and you just have a reaction. Like you could just have lush, soft. Um, you could have um, fragrance. You could have, uh, a reaction to the fabric. Um, it's this idea that how does this image strike you? I see vulnerability and vulnerability is a really important part of your practice and in a part of your engaging with what you're photographing. This one. Wonderful juxtaposition of monotones with a touch of color, incongruous, mm -hmm. mystery and potential energy, blue, enveloping, movement, inversion, immersive, design, different, water, nature, movement, seeing through, organic frozen wasteland, idyllic, IR, artful, natural, I just see blue, dreamscape, peace, cool, refresh. Great. So uh, we're getting at it with incongruous, enveloping. Those are descriptives of, of how this 
image uh, made you feel? Flight, wing, metamorphosis, minimal, delicate. To me, this just feels like Photoshop to invert colors. Cyanotype, question mark, photogram, exclamation point, memory, potentiality, essential, simple and complex nature, x-ray, insect, stark, Great. electrifying, strange, uncomfortable, x-ray, grand sweep, light, rayogram, melancholy, blue, fallen, I, I think that's it. Great. It's really interesting. Um, I, I hear potentiality, metamorphosis. Those are the kinds. That's when you're getting into punctum territory. Um, I hear people looking and thinking of process, um, which, I, which I totally understand. And I also hear opinion, um, which is something that I would move to go beyond. I probably Last left a couple out, but apologies to those I didn't include. Um, empty. Barriers, looking in, looking out. IR, chairs, deserted, peaceful. Curious for five. Too clinical. Former, loneliness. Minimal, pure, clean, organized. Musical chairs. Messy, incomplete thought. Loneliness. Great, so this is perfect because um, what we had, and this is exactly what happened. There's a bunch like, more, so I don't know if you want oh, to. Go know. ahead, go ahead. Um, uh, maybe drug hideout, contrast. Um, I'm trying to figure out, is this the last image? Yes. Okay, then mesmerizing, sensual, evocative, ethereal, memory, beautiful, metamorphosis, rebirth, contemplation, Inflation, creativity, loss, reflection, depth of unknown, from beauty to death, amazement, distant, lonely, distant, divided. Great. Well, we certainly have some agreement on lonely, but what I love and why I thought this is, this is a great response is that we've gone from clinical uh, to messy. We've gone from peaceful to death. We've gone from beautiful to lonely, and we've gone to um, sensual. So those are somewhat, in instances, competing responses. And that's what I think happens when we start to play with punctum. And the one thing I want to say is how can you use punctum practice yourself in your creative practice is to take images of yours, give them to 10 different people, not necessarily artists, and ask for this. Give them a half a minute and say, give me five words, and you'll learn something about your work. And I think that's part of going back to the four pillars. That's part of the critique. Um, and I work with people. I don't have to like a particular person's work uh, or imagery or style to work with them. Um, so getting different people's reactions uh, like isn't always what someone is after. Sometimes people want to be provocative. Um, so this leads me, because part of what I did today was change up my um, presentation to allow for more times for, um, for questions. Um, and this leads to a few ideas that people have uh, utilized to grow concepts. Concepts that came out of questions and how curiosity is really key in your creative practice and following it without having a sense of preconceived notions of what the answers might be. It's questioning and then questioning the questioning. So I am showing an image from Odette England's book called Keeper of the Hearth, which actually circles back to Roland Bart because she was working on a PhD and Roland Bart in Camera Lucida speaks about this image and never shows it. So it, is, it, is, it has been left as a mystery, and that would be really fun to do a poll in ASMP if people want to, uh, believe, want to, to give an a opinion on what they believe, because in academic circles, we don't know if there really ever was an image. Was that, was that an image he remembered? Was it really in real life? Or did he have a composite of images? So Odette England put out that query, what does 
what do you think a Roland, like what was Roland Bart thinking or what is an image that could be the winter garden image in your eye? Well, she had 200 responses and it ended up in this beautiful book, Keeper of the Hearth. On the left is the, co the cover image and why I wanted to reference it is because in uh, Odette's mind and the people making decisions on, on this book, she didn't edit out anything. All of the people who sent her imagery, or sometimes it was words because they didn't have an image, um, she put in the book. But this one, it's by Bill Jacobson, she thought really denoted or connoted punctum, which is that feeling that you get caught in your throat. So I wanted to include that. But why I reflect on this piece is because that was a question and all of a sudden, 200 people give you their idea and you're going through a book that has very varied responses found photographs staged photographs some people sent an object as i mentioned some people did words uh it's a really beautiful exploration i um i interviewed odette and we had a photo book book group um about the process of this book making. And uh, I love it for the beauty and, and, and the experience of being with this book, but also because it's such an example of concept development. Still in the book. I love this quote. This goes way back to Marshall McLuhan, uh, who was looking at changing mediums a long time ago, and our medium certainly keeps changing, kind of rapid fire pace. But I love that he says, nobody can commit photography alone. And that we could have a whole webinar just on that quote, because that speaks to so many different layers of what happens in photography, but you bring so much to your own eye and what you're seeing and your viewer brings all of theirs. Um, it speaks again to the four pillars and collaboration. And I talk about the fact that you are always collaborating. You are collaborating with your work. If you are a photographer doing solo shows in the uh, solo, um, image making uh, in a landscape, you are still collaborating with your equipment, you're collaborating with the weather. Um, there's so many ways in which we need to broaden our uh, view of what we have control over, what we don't. Again, it gives us all those intersections that I spoke of at the beginning because those are places you can take a different turn. I love this and I just found out about this um, this morning. Uh, this is a project that is called um, Shelter in Place Gallery. It was begun by um, Eben Harris, who is someone on furlough from the Boston's MFA, hyper allergic, just wrote about this uh, today. And Karen Haas, a curator at the um, museum, put it out on social media and I grabbed it because this is how we have an example of a furloughed person right now in this um, uh, time of pandemic reached back to something that he had worked on years ago, which was a show that he made a model gallery for. The whole show was this idea that you were gonna have an art fair and each uh, artist at that exhibit had this space. Well, he dusted this off and opened it up. You can go on Instagram and see. He asked for artists making work original now and sending it in a scale of one to 12, and he decorates this gallery. That's the outside. And I just think that is genius. And that speaks to innovation, that speaks to creativity, that think, speaks to thinking outside the box. It speaks to collaborating, um, reimagining. Um, a wonderful, wonderful project. And I encourage you to go look at that. This is um, Caleb Cole, a um, professor and photographer here in the um, Boston area. And when the pandemic started, he gave this as an assignment to his students. You've got Edward Weston on the left and you have Caleb's bedsheet on the right. 
This has been um, amplified by lots of people from different countries. There's now a lot of different streams about going over um, remaking masters and you have somebody with like, you know, uh, uh, toilet paper roll or whatever is a rough, but it's just fun, hilarious, engaging, fascinating, creative. Um, I just love that people are playing because that's a really important part. Um, I have a lot of different examples I could use, but I want to have time for questions. This is um, Everyday Africa started by Peter DeCampo and Austin Merrill. And I bring it up for a few different reasons. One is that I had a gallery exhibition of Peter's work. It was included when he was uh, in the mentoring program at the Seven Photo Agency. These were all documentary photographers playing with their iPhone and frankly with the Hipstamatic app at the time. And my show was called I See the Eyes of Seven in the Hands of Hipstamatic. And it started because the photographers were getting so many hits on their, um, their playful portfolios. And we got thinking about is iPhoneography fine art or could it be? Peter came to do the gallery talk and it was the very beginning of this project. He had gone to Africa taking images, documentary images, often for NGOs. And often there was an anticipation of what those images should be. And meanwhile, Peter was seeing all kinds of other things happening. And the iPhone gave him access that was more intimate. And this whole project started with a photograph he took in an elevator on his way to get a press pass. And it opened up this idea of how do I show people what everyday Africa looks like? Because we are reinforcing stereotypes by some of these uh, images that we're asked to go capture. And he brought his friend, Austin Merrill, who's a writer on the next go around when he had this concept in his mind. And this grew to then saying, wait, there are so many other photographers doing this. Plus Merrill started taking some Austin started taking some really great photographs. This has blossomed into a huge project. It's called Everyday Projects. I took a screen grab. Everyday Projects has such a life and it started with a question and a curiosity and a collaboration. And I won't digress into all the layers it's in. I encourage you to go explore it yourself. And that's where I want to encourage you because you have ideas that need to be um, unearthed and sometimes revisited and definitely delved into. Um, I'm thinking of um, one other idea and I don't have a photograph for it. Um, Talking Pictures was a show at the Museum of Modern Art where the curator, because we have so much digital um, photography, iPhonography, and we have so much that we're talking in pictures. The name of the show was Talking in Pictures, and two artists got in conversation, didn't necessarily and oftentimes didn't know each other, and they only spoke through pictures. That is something all of you could do right now. You could pick a, more than one person, but start just sharing pictures. Your picture makes another person respond. Um, and uh, I love this photograph. Um, I popped it in because I think about how many times the queen has been photographed and she was asked or she was given this photo experience, Chris Levine is a photographer because Chris Levine has a particular way of seeing and he's very clear about what it is. And he brought that way of seeing to a subject that has been photographed in her 94 years a lot and brought something very original and I wanted to include it. Um, I put this up every now and then. It was fun. I, um, I put it up on my social media platforms but also in my presentations and someone on our um, one of our recent beginner's guides, which have gone online and end up bringing in people from different countries, talked about having the same thing on a t-shirt. I took this photograph in Paris. It happened to be in the Marais on the wall. And I'm just wrapping so we have time for questions. This is how you find me. Um, I would love to continue the conversation. Um, I'm giving a beginner's guide tomorrow hosted by Digital Silver Imaging. And um, you're welcome to join that where we would go into a few more of these um, 
aspects of the curriculum a little bit deeper. Um, so, Tom, I hope that there are questions. There are. Um, great. And I'm going to turn it over to that and let people ask me whatever. Okay, let me start with this one from R. Aber. Per the Meyerowitz quote, if your vision is unique, how do you connect it to what your viewers can relate to? That's not your problem. <laughs> You have no control over what your viewer is going to do. Where you have control is your, your connection to what you're photographing. You, if you relate to it and you follow your curiosity and you follow what lights you up, there has to be an enthusiasm on your part, uh, 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 an investigation. If you follow that, a, it's going to be unique, and B, it's going to have what brings out whatever in the viewer, but it's going, they're going, people can relate to it, just like we had that last image in the punctum practice, and someone saw beauty, someone saw death, someone saw it messy, but someone saw it clinical. You have no control over that. Where you have control is you and your work, and that's why that relationship, that conversation is at the heart of it all. Okay, I have another question, same person. Repunctum and the images exercise, if everyone's perceptions are so radically different, example, peaceful versus lonely, how do we communicate matter? In art, I would think it wouldn't matter, but in advertising, it would. Really good question. Um, let's put it this way. I think it always matters in art and in commerce. And I think that there is porousness between those two areas. So why I think the in commerce, if just like Chris Levine took that photograph of the queen, if someone has articulated a vision, they can bring it to commerce in a way that is unique and that that energizes it. So I, I, I'm losing my train of thought, but I think that, um, read the question at the beginning because it goes back to that very- If everyone's perceptions are so radically different, how do we communicate what we want to? Well, I think the communication is really the key. And if you are, if you are in conversation with your work, and, 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 and communicating something that is synergistic to you and generative, that's what you bring to how you look at, at anything. So, so, yeah, go ahead. So that, that raises a question for me, which uh, you know, I've been fascinated about since we first started talking. And that is um, the sort of the interiority, I guess, if we a better way of saying it, of your own artistic impulse. And how do you, I know that a lot of your practice is helping people uh, access that at the deepest possible level and understand the things that might be barriers to think, you know, to that encounter. What do you see the most, particularly in the time that we're in, what are you seeing as the most significant barriers that would keep a, create a person from really accessing their true self creatively? Now, um, now I think it's, uh, it is so complicated by, um, I keep thinking of bandwidth. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a great deal of our bandwidth taken up just in trying to digest and uh, understand, not even uh, consciously. So I think that um, it, it, it's a tall order to say, um, deal with all the other aspects of this uh, reality and create. Um, what I'm trying to do is saying that creativity is generative and it's, it's something that can help you cope with the layers of what's happening, particularly right now. So I think, um, I think just what amount of bandwidth we have. Um, I think um, 
that there, there's always fear in creativity. I think that that's just part of it. Um, that's that whole thing about getting comfortable with being uncomfortable. I think that vulnerability is in there and that vulnerability comes from doing the interior work, which is why when I work with people, I try to create a really safe space because if you're going to, to work with your creative process with me either individually or in a group we want to have a um a safe space for that because uh you you are opening yourself up to vulnerability there's reflections in 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 the work um and i, I did another book um photo book book group and we talked about it, it was august sander i quoted and and he was doing uh speaking about photographing and the the act of um documenting who we are and what we are and being able to see it and not to document just what we like or or want people to see about us but all of it and i think um you know i just saw a spread today on um the pandemic that was uh, funeral directors and people dealing with that end of this uh crisis and obviously that's that's super challenging but that is um that is the real that is what we're what we're in do you think that the um the moment that we're in is unlike any other moment that creative people have faced say in the last 50 years do you think this is that unique in a, a moment in time Absolutely. I don't. I mean, we'll be unpacking this for decades. Frankly, um, I think it is um, monumental in the sense that um, so many issues have been laid bare by what would normally have been the noise or the denial or the distraction, and um, we're going to have to contend with that. It's it's massive. Um, and I think it's going to be, um, I think we're going to have a lot of creative responses to it, both visually, the visual narrative, but I think the socio-political uh, implications, massive. Yeah, I certainly would agree with that based on what I'm seeing here in Washington, D.C. these days. Oh. Uh, a question from David Austin. Mm -hmm. How do we respond to the deflation and the cheapening of photography, you know, from commodities to disposables? And I suppose that's a reflection of feeling, I'm not going to put words in David's mouth, but I know that that's a question that I've heard really expressed as I was making, and a lot of my colleagues were making the transition from film to digital. You know, they saw the potentiality of what's implied in David's question. Yeah, that's an ongoing question. Um, because everyone walks around with an iPhone, you could say everyone is a photographer, but I don't believe that. Um, there are so many layers that go into an impactful image. So there is something about the formal aspects of a photograph that someone who is professional has honed that skill. Um, there's also, um, I think I might have mentioned this in my last talk with you, but the idea that Stephen Mays, a great thinker on photography, talked about the printing press making this huge uh, difference so many years back, but it did not it meant this this uh, being able to have mass distribution of writing, but it didn't stop people from making books. Well, we have mass distribution of images, but it's not going to stop people from making photographs. And which photographs are really going to um, stand out? Um, and it's interesting, someone on one of my groups was talking, um, an online group, wondering about how right now in the pandemic people are offering um, porch portraits and how that could be deflating the market for family photography. And I understand mm -hmm. the concern. Um, however, I think we are all being asked to be comfortable with something super uncomfortable. Like the, the, the amount of uncertainty of right now is mind boggling. And frankly, every institution, every art institution, think about it, every ad agency, every commercial entity, every artist, no matter the medium, 
all the nonprofits that support and, and amplify what artists do, all of the institutions like MFAs and, and um, arts organizations. We were already on slippery landscape with the, um, the gallery system and representation being changed and um, people are working in collaboration a lot. There's more collectives. There's more of an access to um, an audience because of our social media platforms. So what I'm trying to say is no one knows where we're all going to fit. No one knows about the monetization of what's going to happen. I think, and perhaps this is uh, something that could come out of it. I was on a call uh, locally where we had almost 100 arts organizations, artists and art organizations. And it was across every auspice, every medium. And you had the city and you had the federal, we didn't have federal, we had state, city, local. And all of a sudden we're like, wait, we're talking to each other in ways we never did before. We are so siloed in so many things and it infuriates me because I watch it in our field and there's so much wasted energy because we're all reinventing the wheel when honestly connecting the dots would make it all so much better. So I, my hope going forward is that those silos, that intersectionality starts to happen. Um, yeah. And here's, a, here's another question that I have, and that is, do you think, certainly I would say that the iPhone or smartphone photography has maybe increased a certain kind of pressure to differentiate images that are merely captured from those are, that are made with intention and that sometimes that's lost perhaps on the public because they're just getting the ceaseless flow of imagery over their, the banks of their individual lives on a daily basis. Do you think that that is a permanent change or do you think that, I know, I guess what I'm asking is that is out of a, you know, a fear that I've often heard expressed recently that somehow the, the people, the, the uh, work of artists who master craft in a certain way to be able to fully express themselves as a life's work, you know, that it's been, that there won't be that opportunity to, to create that work in the future because the support mechanisms won't be in place. And, you know, based on the conversations that you're having now, Sibyl, I'm just wondering if you see that as an unwarranted fear or a logical fear. Interesting. I think there's actually been uh, people going back to different ways of seeing and different um, uh, manners of making pictures, alternate processes. So I think um, the fear, uh, I guess what I was thinking is that we have an opportunity for the tactile. I was, I was listening to um, uh, someone speaking today about um, the pandemic and the impact of not having touch and talking about receiving a letter now and that the letter had a photograph in it and how the letter and the photograph transmitted touch, transmitted what we get from touch. And I think that a lot of artists are, are, are driven by tactile uh, texture um, and I think, you know, what, what happened is we lost a lot of mediums uh, as we went through the digital revolution. Some of the media that you needed to create in a certain style changed, like literally like, okay, there goes your favorite paper. Um, mm -hmm. That's very challenging. And that has been an ongoing situation. Um, I don't think we'll ever lack for an art market because I think it is innate, like someone said, a scratch or itch that has to be scratched. Um, I also think that documenting, that seeing ourselves through photography helps us understand ourselves. And I think we're really going to be a lot more curious. Someone wrote a great article uh, in the Times today, and they talked about um, post-traumatic growth instead of post-traumatic stress. And he actually made a... Um, a photo metaphor because he used it as our aperture in the situation has been opened and are we going to go forward and not close it 
Um, I put a link on it in my Facebook page because I thought that was so amazing. And so documenting what we're going through right now or even using photography to figure it out as we come out of it, we're gonna be part of that. And uh, one of the things that I, uh, one of the other photo book, book groups that I did online was looking at um, conversations of in conflict photography by Lauren Walsh. And one of the most amazing things in the United States, there, our, our need for journalism and photojournalism and actually grounded in ethics and grounded in this idea of, of, of following something till you're, you're revealing it is so needed at the moment. And in the United States, the news is the third area of coverage. Number one is sports, number two is celebrity, and number three is news. It's not the same in other countries. Um, and um, so I think photography is gonna play a big role in how we understand and how we change, how we, how we land, like, because nobody knows. Right, and I mean, the, the, to me that just, the centrality of photography as a means of apprehending the world accurately, I guess just for lack of a better way of saying that, or at least understanding the intentions of the photographer working in that kind of a milieu. It just seems to me that it's, it is incredibly essential right now because there's so many other institutions that are deliberately fogging the landscape for various kinds of advantage. So, I mean, I'm, bullish at least to that extent myself. So here's another question from Harry Lee. It appears then, based on the conversation today, that for a meaningful, in parenthesis, successful client relationship, it would be necessary to understand the client's needs in order to deliver a satisfactory product or service, which may not always be in agreement with one's own tastes. Can you comment about the dichotomy that might exist in that circumstance? Absolutely, because that's the kind of, I mean, I spent years as a stylist, a creative and artistic director. Um, you're interpreting in the commercial world. Um, your, your um, you know, your ability to um, nail a particular uh, uh, visual language may not be uh, what you want. Uh, for instance, like I am not um, uh, uh, a fly fisherman, but I've worked for Orvis, right? So it wasn't to my aesthetic, but I could interpret their aesthetic. And then you've got the other one, which is why I use the Chris Levine image. He had an aesthetic and then they wanted to use it in that particular way. So I think that as visual storytellers, we, meet, we need to be nimble. And, and frankly, when you're working with a client and there are these limitations, um, you have to work within them. And you have to, to, to use your innovation or, or work, find something in there to um, explore or illuminate in a new way. And then the more that you develop your particular way of seeing and style, perhaps you are going to be tapped to bring that way of seeing into someone else's worldview or, or uh, need. That happens a lot with even NGOs are, are waking up to like, oh yeah, we're not gonna send you with a preconceived idea here, we'll take what you find. Or other people, I, I had this in my head before, Stephanie Sinclair, a photographer who was taking pictures and, and, and finding um, this, that when she was in some uh, Middle Eastern countries that these very young girls were setting themselves on fire and she was horrified. Well, when her investigation went into that, it discovered a practice of being too young to wed, children as young as five. And that has grown to an, its own organization called Too Young to Wed. Um, stopping or at least illuminating that practice, which is what you were talking about, Tom, when you can bring photography to a reality that we don't even realize is happening and start shedding light on what is happening and how that can then create change. So let me ask one other question on behalf of Jessica Hayes. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us the name of the artist? And that was the artist who had the hand who was doing the gallery, you know, the 
modeling on the one to 12 scale. What was that artist's name? Oh yes, I'm sorry, I can go back to that. If you go on Instagram, it's shelter in place is the uh, feed and the artist is Eben, E-B-E-N Harris, H-A-R-R-I-S, um, whom I've never met, I hope to, um, who is, uh, right now had such response to this was um, having um, socially distant artwork originals left to be able to place into his gallery and he hopes to do something with a wider um, uh, reach. Um, and I mean, when I look at what he's doing and think of everyday Africa, you know, Peter started that 10 years ago. Um, who knows where even might be with this idea. It's fabulous. Okay, and this one from Carlos Arnaiz. Who is your favorite classic artist and your contemporary one? Ah, that's put on the spot. Um, <laughs> classic artist. Hmm. Because you'd have to actually define classic and con uh, and then contemporary. That's true. And he, Carlos did not. So he's okay. leaving so, it to your interpretation. Okay. So one is I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to go with someone who was really seminal in my, my development as a visual, um, uh, a visual culture addict. Um, and that's Lillian Bassman. So she passed away a few years ago and Lillian Bassman, I actually tried to um, do a movie on her and Sarah, uh, Moon had actually done it, uh, and uh, it's called Something About Lillian, but I'd even written the treatment, and I had the opportunity. I literally um, met Lillian at the end of her life. Her life story is amazing because she was seminal, uh, best friends with um, Richard Avedon, uh, helped him get on the cover of Junior Bazaar, and um, paralleled his career. She shared a dark room with George Poynage and Hume. She was a graphic artist, and the way she saw in the 40s and 50s, stopped my heart. Talk about punctum. I had a visceral reaction to Lillian Bassman's work mm -hmm. and I adored it. Um, so she's my fa favorite classic and I have a, I have a rich uh, relational history with that. Plus I also, as a, when I was going through my career with two kids, she did too. And uh, she was rediscovered literally in her 80s and worked through her 90s. And uh, her daughter was interviewed for the New York Times and talked about how, um, how come her mother wasn't as known as her best pal, Richard Avedon. And she said she went to PTA meetings. So I loved her on um, the whole idea of a working <laughs> mom. Um, yes. Contemporary, oh my gosh. I, it was really funny. I am, uh, I'm a glutton for imagery, imagery. And I go to Paris Photo every year and uh, Robert Klein uh, teased me about that because after days of literally several thousand images, I'm ready for more. So I like a lot of different genres. Um, I like when someone is so, um, uh, uh, I remember everyone's reaction to that first image when everyone was like, this is confusing and what do you want me to think? It's like, I want someone to make me think or I want someone to put me um, on edge. Um, I love wit in photography and in art and, uh, and it's there. So I, I would be hard pressed to tell you my favorite contemporary. I mean, I'm a curator too. And so I fall in love with all kinds of work. And, and that's really what's wonderful about what I do. I, I, I just keep finding new loves. It's a lot of crushes. <laughs> Great. And I want to ask you one last question, and then I want to close with a couple of uh, thoughts that are, have been articulated to me in our, in our uh, chat box. But there is, I mean, and this kind of takes, comes back to this idea that we're awash in images on a daily basis and we kind of swim through a sea of them. And, you know, probably the most successful ones stop us and pierce the heart as you've been describing today, Sibylla. But what would you say to those who also say that there's a lot of chaff with the wheat and there's, that it's difficult to find people who can see beyond the chaff to maybe appreciate the kind of artistic intention and effort that would be characteristic of the people that you work with on a regular basis. 
Do you think there's a problem of uh, audience education or uh, needing to inspire the audiences in a different way or relate to them in a different way to get past that? Yeah, so you brought up two things. Um, visual literacy, um, I think when I was talking about Lauren Walsh's work, it's media literacy. So um, I think an interesting thing is that given the change and the dynamics within the field, like when someone just said, what's a classic photograph? Um, because of the history of photography, we can talk about iconic photographs. Well, we have, uh, be difficult to say what's an iconic photograph now. Um, World Press Photo or the New York Times tries to do that on an annual basis of, of saying like, what is a, what are the photographs of now? So yes, there's a lot more to weed through. Um, what rises to the top and what is key is that piece of punctum. And is that place where, where you are moved? Like when you look at the World Press photo and one of my um, classes, I often give an example of John Stanmeyer's work, who I think it was 2015, won the World Press photo image of the year. Very haunting, really beautiful image. And what is the, what is the um, journalistic background of that image is completely different than what people's take of it is as well as their like engagement in it and i think that that's what ha what is happening is we are becoming more liter visually sophisticated our literacy visually is increasing and so the demand to be very clear about your intention and your craft and your view the more that that relationship is strong, the more it will elevate and have an impactful image and the more that the impactful image will rise to the top. But any model that we had in the past, it's just not there. It's not there in the same way. You know, there's this whole, you, we've, you know, you, you, you comment on that I deal with gender parity in photography, it's outstanding. Photography out of all the mediums in the fine arts, we as genders started at the same time. Women did not have the same access, but they were taking photographs in the 1890s. Why is women's representation photographically in major institutions under 10%? And if you are a person, a woman of color, so women generally six to eight percent everywhere, 70 different institutions. If you're a woman of color, two percent. So as a, as a field in photography, we have a lot of work to do. What is that talking about that women have been taking the pictures but haven't been shared? So, so there's real um, exciting ground, there's opportunity, there's illuminating things that need to change. Um, and the iconic images, uh, you know, hands down, were taken and held on to by men. Um, you know, women weren't even part of the Western civilization history of art till the 1980s in some of the tombs that were there out of thousands of works. Um, so it speaks to a lot of other layers. That's the socio-political part that I find fascinating and that I still speak about because it's- It seems it's like there's so much to unpack there that that too is probably a subject for another <laughs> webinar session, but I think I would love to- going. Uh, I would love to bring you, but knowing <laughs> of some of our previous conversations, Sabella, I would love to yeah. bring you back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we are now out of questions officially. Oh, there is one more, one more Great. that just came in. Will there, will there be more images enlarging compassion and humanity in the pandemic coverage or will the kind of some of the focus on the tragedy of it perhaps cause people to go in the other direction? What's your thought Such on that? A great question. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm going to direct you to the, um, on my blog, we put up 
some of our photo book, book groups with the recording and the, the conversations on conflict photography, that is the entire um, ideology of that book because looking at some imagery can actually turn off what you act the intent to have empathy. Um, so there's, that's a huge, huge um, uh, subject. However, one of the things that, that's why I brought up the post-traumatic growth and that metaphor of the aperture, we are empathic in a way we never have been. You have people saying to delivery people, DoorDash, thank you, thank you for coming out. Who's essential? Isn't that interesting? Because who's doing the essential work? It's turned us on our ear, going back to gender issues. It was another New York Times article that essential now, because of the pandemic, guess what it's revealed? More women are essential workers. So that whole idea that I hope the aperture that this crisis has opened for us to be empathic of so much that is in plain sight that we don't normally see or stop and recognize, um, I hope it doesn't go away. And I think seeing the full range um, of this pandemic is also another opportunity because people will focus on um, frontline workers. My son is a frontline worker. Um, however, they are actually doing something tangible. Um, and so it, it isn't like we can take the focus off of everybody's individual experience and put it on one aspect. That's not the full picture. One of the things that's being illuminated is who is dying at larger rates, and it's significantly people of color um, and underserved populations and underinsured populations. Um, so I think our empathy has been ripped open, and I hope there's no way to sew it back up. I think we need to learn. Um, that's, that's my hope. And, and I again go back to Rebecca Soltnick, uh, talking about it not being uh, la la land, not being like, oh, this is going to be great. Um, and I do a lot of heralding creativity and opportunity um, because that is, as I said, life affirming. And in one of the articles, I think it was on um, shelter in place. It was written up in the um, Boston Globe or in Hyperallergic today. And um, I think it was even Harris said, I feel like I'm providing a bit of blue sky in that project. And that's what I feel like creativity does. And it doesn't mean that you diminish the crisis, the danger or anything. It's the ability to hold both. All right, one last question. Sure. And then I wanna end with a couple of thoughts. Great. Thinking about creative briefs from clients, how much do you pull back the curtain of the creative process to your potential client? Or is there a deliberate client side creative view which is more business oriented when you're working with your If I understand that, does that mean um, that you want to educate your um, client visually. Um, I think that's I think that's implicit in the question. I would yeah. say. Yeah. I, and, I, and is that more important than you know that some of the the business side conversation? I guess. I think that you get respect from that. Um, I used to be laughed at when I was collaborating because I'd always come into the team with a million tears to say because I would want us to get a communal visual language and I'd always have all these different examples. But I think if you are able to educate your client visually, for instance, giving examples of um, images next to each other to show the difference in the impact, I think that that's really, um, that that's valued. Um, I was brought on to do, um, art directing for a catalog that had such specific rules that literally it was how many buttons could be unbuttoned in a particular photograph. And I took something unbuttoned, scrunched it, and threw it in front of the camera and everybody had a heart attack. And I was like, that's why you brought me in here. You want to see different, you want to get to a different, uh, um, client and then my job as the um, 
the art director, I had eight stylists, was to help them all get a new way of seeing because they were so limited in where they were. And it, it opened up a whole new thing. A great answer, a great answer. I want to just spend a second to, to offer a thought on today's conversation because it's, I knew it was going to be fascinating and I knew how much I would enjoy it just having you on, Sybil, and I appreciate very much your time on this. Part of the reason that we've been doing these Wednesday webinars in particular is because we really have wanted to bring on guests who would help, uh, help reshape perhaps those who are attending think about their own lives and their own work at a time when social distancing is really forcing us into periods of isolation. And I think, you know, that is really the intention of these kinds of webinars. And we have, I think, been trying to run a gamut ranging from uh, very practical information that could be useful in terms of thinking about your business and some of the legal and other kinds of requirements that may emerge on the other side of this pandemic. But today, to me, it was just like a blast of fresh air and blue sky oxygen. And I'm profoundly grateful that I've had the opportunity to have Sybil on and share this with you. And I think we're gonna continue to try to do this and continue to try to extend these conversations. And why I'm making this point before I get to my final point is that in the process of the chats and, and uh, comments today, there was one from a, a photographer who I know very well and have worked with who said, this is not a question, but a thank you. This was refreshing and it has shifted my thoughts on photography. And then this one from Honey Lazare, Lazar, I definitely grew because of working with Sibylla, whose guidance is priceless. I look forward to a solo show this fall, should there be shows that would not have been possible without Sibylla's care. Thank you for this talk today. Once again, I feel inspired. And I hope that everybody who's been in attendance today walks away feeling similarly inspired because the villas, you know, I have just le absolutely loved this conversation. And um, I want to end by just saying that I know that, you know, everyone is giving up their time and coming to these things and you've got Zoom invitations probably all over the universe, you know, coming at you every day. But, uh, you know, we see it as our mission and we really take pride in the fact of being able to do this and contribute hopefully to the building of community and being advocates for you in a variety of ways. And I know that a lot of you are probably members, but there also may be some among you who are not members right now, but, um, and you may not even be in a position to become a member of ASMP. But if you found value, as I hope you have, in what we've offered today and what we're going to be continuing to offer, not only with our Wednesday webinars, but also with our town halls, um, we'd love to have your support. We do make this possible. And, uh, you know, there is a button on our website, uh, which I, obviously I should have uh, earmarked, but didn't. Um, but anyway, there's a way that you can donate and any kind of contribution, every contribution is valuable. Every contribution is important and it allows us to keep going. So I, I just want to thank everybody again. And for Sybilla, I want to thank you very much from the bottom of my heart. I wish you all a good day today. I want you to stay safe and I hope to see you. We will have another town hall this Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. And I hope many of you will be able to join that as well. So again, Sybilla, thanks so much for today. My privilege. Thank you. And thanks everyone.